All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's uh, Crypto Oracle Collective call. Uh, it is February 15th and uh, we've got a great guest today, Kat Kuzmaskis, uh, co-founder of Shire and Tamarin. And uh, before we hand it off to her, uh, Lilia, if you stop share the screen for a moment. Um, we always start the collective calls. First, we uh, talk about how many uh, members we have. And so we've got uh, 147, so that's up one from Monday. Uh, and you know, we're still seeing you know, really nice growth there. And we then uh, ask if there are any new people on the call who haven't been on a call before. And if so, you know, raise your hand or just start shouting out and why don't you introduce yourself for you know, 30, 45 seconds if there's any first timers on the call. Once, anybody? Oh, um, well, sorry, Lou, did someone just tried to <clears throat> say it again. Uh, someone introduce. <clears throat> well, for the first timers, so you. Oh, no, you, no, no. You've no, been no, here no. before. Yeah, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. I misheard. Sorry, interruption. Um, okay, well, great. Well, if there aren't any uh, first timers on the call, uh, then we will hand it over to our special guest, Kat. So, Kat, you're joining us. Uh, how were you introduced to the collective? I was introduced by Lacey. Ah, terrific. Thank terrific. And are you familiar with uh, our uh, collective member, Alex Kahana? Um, no. Yeah, OK. <laughs> He's Dr. Alex Kahana. And, and for me, I, I think of him as, as the smartest person, at least I know, at the intersection of crypto and healthcare. Oh, um, awesome. I yeah. will look him up. Is Alex on this call? Uh, I don't think so. I assume he'd say something if he was. Um, but he was actually the featured guest at Crypto Mondays NYC this week as well. Oh, very cool. I yeah. emailed him about you, Kat, already. So awesome. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so terrific, Kat. So uh this the floor is yours. Do you want to share great. a presentation or sure? It's just small images, but for the visual learners among us or those that like to look at pictures, this will help. So I'm Pat, nice to meet everybody. I am the uh, co-founder of Shiro and founder of Cameron. Uh, a little quick intro on my background. So I come from healthcare. I worked in the belly of the beast, if you will, at Yale New Haven Health. <laughs> and, um, uh, <laughs> it is a and now she time. knows the full truth. Hey guys. If you're not talking or you're not a featured guest, please mute. Thanks. Ooh. Got it. So in the belly of the beast, uh, Yale New Haven Health is a three, at the time when I worked there, $3 billion enterprise in healthcare, uh, multiple hosp hospital health system, and I was on the business side of the hospital. Um, I did not know before I started working at Yale that there was an entire business side of healthcare if you will, I was a public health master's degree uh, student. Before that, I'd worked in community health and global health, but never, it was more on the operations side, but not so much the market share side. So when I started at Yale New Haven, I was thrown into the department that was responsible for growing the market share of the medicine and surgery service lines. So that's everything from musculoskeletal to uh, transplant to um, ear, nose, and throat, um, basically just very, very specialty areas underneath medicine and surgery. So I used a lot of data to create business analyses that basically said, this is where we should put our next OB gen office. This is where we should put our next pediatrician office. And this is why. Um, and we, we, for that, we relied on a lot of data that we purchased. Um, and one of the reasons that I left Yale New Haven is because it was absurd to me that it was easier to buy health data than it was for us to have access to all of our data in one place. So I've been working on data access in healthcare for uh, a long time, since 2016. Um, and I will kind of touch on the story of Shiro and Tamarin, and then we can dive into specifics that in areas that interest you. But the story I think is important because when it comes to Web3, a lot of people, uh, especially in the early days, wanted blockchain to basically create interoperability in healthcare. Um, that is not what it does. Um, it 
offers an opportunity for data access, but we're going to talk a little bit about why that's tricky and kind of why we haven't seen it yet, but also why I think now is the right time to get started with that. So I'll launch in by talking about Shiro and Tamarin. So Shiro's uh, our little mushroom character here on the left. And uh, the reason for the name Shiro is if you are familiar with mushrooms uh, or the forest or biology or ecology, then you may know that the root system of mushrooms is called mycelium. Another word for that is uh, Shiro, S-H-I-R-O. Um, that URL name was taken, so I threw a Y in it, you know, standard startup style misspelling the name. But the idea is that this underground network of mushrooms can actually communicate. And without it, we actually, a lot of biologists and scientists argue that we don't have life. So this root system is how life happens in the forest biology is created and how trees communicate. So when I thought about this issue around data access in healthcare, wouldn't it be wonderful if all this data interconnected, intersected and relied on each other so that health apps can use all of that same data. So when we look at Shiro, what we're building is a data network. And on top of it are, um, and then connecting into the Web3 side, then putting apps on top of that that can leverage this network. So that's a little bit of um, where the name comes from and hope it gives a glimpse of what we're doing. So where I sit in healthcare and Web3 is I really believe that we will have a future of borderless healthcare. I think that it will be an interesting conversation one day to say, wasn't it funny that we had to see a physician within our state? Or wasn't it funny that we had to see physicians in, you know, in network and it was expensive to go out of network? Whereas now I can see a physician anywhere. I can see the top surgeon, uh, no matter where they're located. I can um, access surgery remotely. I don't have to go down the street to mass gen if I don't want to. And I really think we're moving to a system where this idea of healthcare being confined will be a thing of the past. Uh, and this is long-term thinking. This is like, you know, probably along the same timelines of people thinking when we're gonna be living on Mars. But I do think that, th that this is totally possible. And the reason why I think a borderless healthcare system is totally possible is because we have all of the components to make this possible now. We just need to build up to it over time. So one of the areas that I like to talk about is telesurgery. This blew my mind when I found out that you could actually do surgery remotely on patients. As in the physician, the surgeon does not have to be in the same room as the patient. You may be familiar with this with robotic surgery where the physician may be working with robotic arms in the surgery, um, but they've actually, science has taken it a step further where there was a research study of a surgery uh, where a physician was five miles away from the patient when they conducted that surgery. Granted, the patient at that time was a mouse, um, but you can start to see that with this new, with the new 5G um, connectivity, the ability of robotics and surgery, you can bring all of this together and telesurgery is a possibility. It's not without risks, but it is a possibility. The other areas of healthcare that already exist that make a borderless healthcare system possible is telehealth. So this exploded during COVID. A lot of patients prefer telemedicine for the same reasons we prefer remote work. Uh, we have wearables that connect uh, to our health, um, primary health data sources. These watches can now predict everything from COVID to flu to arrhythmia and diabetes. So we're starting to get much more advanced in terms of what can be predicted from our data. All of our data sits in electronic medical records. We can do prescriptions online and through teleprescription, telepharmacy. And then of course there's medical tourism. So all of these pieces exist, but why haven't we seen it yet? Um, and kind of what's that web three connection? What's that connection with, with that data network? So the problems in my perspective boil down to three things. One is data is inaccessible. It sits in silos, specifically because of the incentives. There is an incentive structure around data. We know this in web three. We are, most of us are advocates about uh, being uh, data dividends are being rewarded for our data. We know that there's an incentive around data. We know that data drives technology now and technology in the future. And then the other area is lack of global trust. Uh, when you think about healthcare, there really is, other than cultural perspectives, there really is not a difference in treating the flu or um, cardiovascular health for someone here versus Dubai versus Mexico. Um, it really is, is the same approach. 
taking cultural sensitivities into account. So why isn't there global trust when it comes to a healthcare system? So we'll tackle each one of these and talk about um, where we are in terms of the industry from problem to solutions. So right now, or historically, we've known that data has been inaccessible in healthcare. It sits in silos. Uh, there's a great article in Forbes where it talks about a billionaire owns all of our healthcare data. And that's true. Her, she's a female CEO, and she's the CEO of a company called Epic. And Epic is an electronic medical record system that pretty much every academic medical system uses. And that data that that hospital is sitting on, just like we did at Yale, sits in one location. Or they actually sell it up to healthcare um, data brokers who then sell it right back out to people like me at Yale New Haven to analyze it. Um, so there's a big business around data, which is why in the past, it has been inaccessible in silos. But now, and I'm talking like very, very recently, like 2021 recent, this data is now starting to be, be released and become available. And that's through APIs, federal mandates, and we're almost there, but whereas we as the patients can be the owner of that data. So it's important to talk about incentives here because people think of healthcare as altruistic and you know physicians are in it for the goodness of their heart and so are hospital administrators. But when it comes down to it, specifically in the United States, and also internationally, even if you are in a single payer healthcare system, healthcare is a business and it comes down to profit, even if it's nonprofit. There are incentives in the entire healthcare infrastructure and that is the same for data. So if we're gonna make data flow, then we have to pair it with the incentives. What we've seen so far to make that data flow around APIs, one is now just in 2021, there is a company that has connected to almost every single wearable device and created a standardized API. How are they able to do that? And they actually have um, exclusivity with a lot of devices. The way that they were able to do that is they can say that by opening access to the data, you are actually, at, like the Whoop watch, for example, you can expand the number of people that are interested in your watch because there are way more applications that can use that data now because you've opened up that API. Another area specifically in the United States is there are federal requirements and hefty fines if companies like Yale New Haven do not give you access to your data into an app like Shiro, third-party app, where it can be all in one place. That did not exist until October, 2022. That is when that law went into effect. Prior to that, all of these companies were holding on to your data because it was much better to keep it in one place. They had the IP, they had the incentive to keep it. The area that's still open and needs a little bit of exploration around incentives is how we get hands into the patient's devices um, and into the patient's hands. Uh, and the reason that that hasn't happened yet is because all of the incentives around healthcare data have been focused on the federal government and uh, in healthcare institutions. So I mentioned Epic earlier, that is the one of the largest electronic medical records in the world, um, not just in the United States, it's a multi-billion dollar, hev heavily profitable company. Um, and the reason why is because it's federally required that healthcare institutions have an electronic medical record, they are the ones that maintain it, not the patient. And then the institution gets fined if they don't have that, and they spend billions of dollars to implement this technology. So it leaves and has left the patient out. Uh, so yes, there was a, a great idea to put, to digitize our health data, but perhaps it was a little backwards in terms of how they implemented it. Um, looking backwards now, it would have been much better to put the data in our hands and put the incentives around that. But here we are, um, our data sits in a bunch of different locations and we're trying to get it in one place. So how do we do that? How do we wrap the incentives around that? Um, you might not want to hear this, um, but it is the way of the world when it comes to data. And two possible incentive mechanisms are advertising and um, data analytics. Now, there is a way to do this in a very, uh, I think Web3 really pioneered this, but there's a way to do this uh, that brings all of us in as patients into the benefit, and that's through data dividends, which I, I think we're all familiar with. And the reason why I think that this incentive for patient data makes sense now is because we know that cookies are disappearing, and that's great. We should not be tracked online. We should be able to have ownership and authority over what happens to our data, which is becoming incredibly personal and personalized. 
And then also because this healthcare analytics market, almost 90 billion uh, market size by 2027, when we can open up access to that data, that's gonna create incredible amount of innovation that we had no idea could exist from this data because it was previously in a silo. So all of this talking oh. about data, oh. opening up access to data. Do I have a question? No, just people okay. don't know how to mute. <laughs> um, so we, so what lies in cracking this and opening up access to this so that we can have the healthcare system of the future is creating that incentive to get the data in the hands of the patient, in our hands. Uh, so how you go to market with that is very tricky. And this is something that we've been looking at since 2016. We have tried it a lot of different ways. Um, and I think we've finally landed on what makes the most sense. And what we keep hearing and reading and seeing is that we are interested in personalization. Uh, this is, we are busier than ever, even though there is an incredible amount of technology that's supposed to make our lives easier. So we want everything personalized. And it was shocking to me, and probably shocking to some of, of the other folk in the Web3 community, that 87% of people are okay handing over personal details if they're going to get value in return. So we're starting to see that folks are wanting a value transfer. That could be anything from data dividends, that could be from personalized and faster decision making. Um, this is right for you right now. And that's the angle that we're taking with Shiro. We're actually creating a personal health concierge so that all of your data is in one place and gone are the days that you have to search for a primary care physician. Or for me, I was diagnosed with uh, a, a, a chronic disease two years ago that opened up my eyes to just health situations that I had my whole life. And once I figured that out with this diagnosis, I was then freaking out about how I manage it. And I come from healthcare. I'm a former hospital administrator and I had no idea how to manage this disease. And that's where Shiro starts. All your data in one place. Let's figure out how to help you manage your health in the way that you want to. And then we share data dividends on the back end. So we're going to market with focused on personalized health savings. Um, this may resonate with some of you, it may not, but you are probably overpaying for your prescriptions. So we're starting there. So we're starting with your prescription list and figuring out how to get you to the lowest possible price point and then moving up from there, helping you negotiate your medical bills. 80% of medical bills are uh, overpaid. They're too much, you are overbilled. Um, and then moving down through the value chain, you're probably paying too much to see your primary care physician, you're probably paying too much to see your specialist. And so we're gonna move through that value chain to, to find savings for folks as we start to bring their data in one place and bring value to that data. This is also really helpful as those of us um, globally are feeling uh, a lot of financial stress with you know, the macro economy state. So that's where Shiro is starting with the ultimate goal of really creating this data layer, this data network, focusing on true ownership, eventually then trust in the borderless incentive. And that's where Tamarin comes in. So Tamarin is, we are building uh, Nectar, which is this little tiny drop here, to for that future state of a borderless healthcare infrastructure, borderless healthcare system. Um, so really building on top of the data infrastructure that Shira has created. True ownership is the goal of your data, like legit true ownership, not just it sits in an AWS server by one person trust and borderless incentive. The way that we're doing that is we're creating a HIPAA compliant decentralized file storage. The decentralized means that it's not owned by Tamarin. We're one of the node managers, but we're not, we do not own it. We're bringing in secure multi-party computation so that we can add on that data analysis layer with extreme privacy and ZK proofs and zero knowledge rollups. So we are very early in this development. It is a layer two. And um, we have over a million dollars in grant funding from the National Science Foundation. And we're working with researchers and university professors from University of Pennsylvania, George Washington and Carnegie Mellon to bring all of this and put it together so that we can create that global infrastructure for a borderless healthcare system. So I will stop there and open up to questions. Fantastic, that was great. Um... Who wants to go for? Oh, Johnny already <laughs> raised his hand. All right, tradition continues. Go, Johnny. I purposely waited to the very last minute to raise my hand. Um, this is really cool. 
I, I think this is one of the only, one of the first examples I've seen that actually solves this problem. I love that you're tackling this from the, the file, like storing the file storage angle first. Um, is there anything you can tell us about your tokenomics or your plan for tokenomics that's going to create the incentives that, um, that you mentioned earlier? Yes. I'm glad you asked, Johnny, nice to meet you. I am just gonna be really honest and say we have not figured this out yet. So a portion of our NSF grant is focused on how we tokenize this in a way that makes sense. One of the things that frustrates me so much about crypto, and I've been in the space since 2016 when I won one Bitcoin and I didn't know what a Bitcoin was, <laughs> uh, and then bought Ethereum at $11. Um, I, the speculation really bothers me a lot. And what I've seen from tokenomics is just pure speculation. So we're going to be working with our university partners to figure out a tokenomics model that makes sense. With that said, also, the reason that I'm very excited about the, about this organization is, is the wealth of knowledge in web three. So we are open to figuring out tokenomics that makes sense. The, the money is there to create data dividends, um, in terms of what we've seen for what people are paying for healthcare data, it, it can explode once we actually make this data available. So we know that there is an option around tokenomics. We know that we want to tie data dividends to that. And we also want to tie in some really cool areas of other aspects of tokenization. For example, one of the ways that we propose creating a HIPAA compliant environment is actually using a risk-based model. Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, so when someone, to create the network, it's essentially going to be three parties. It's going to be an authorizer, a, uh, a reviewer, and then the person that wants to join. So the when you want to join the network, you say, I want to become a HIPAA compliant node. The authorizer says, great, um, this is what it takes to be a HIPAA compliant node. And then um, once you've done that, you get passed by the authorizer, and then you go to an independent auditor that then make sure that you actually have done all the HIPAA compliant stuff. But those three, all of those three nodes together are in a risk model, which means there's sharing of revenue and also sharing of risk. And so that helps to prevent the authorizer and auditor basically passing anybody through. And if you're in actually a risk-based model in an incentivized risk-based model, then it helps to uh, you know, kind of push down on the fraud. So those are some of the areas that we're thinking about, but open to a lot of discussion around that and ideas. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. It actually is very analogous to a couple of clients that the collective currently has or, or has had in the past. So um, totally understand what you're what you're going for. If you need another brain in the room or um, someone to read a white a draft of a white paper, let us know. We're happy to uh, happy to help out. Awesome. Thanks. I was going to say, I know this collective that has a lot of smart tokenization people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know people. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would say that we've done our job when people no longer think tokenization is about financialization. I think, obviously, this, it makes sense why people feel that way. But I think if someone asked me to, to um, describe tokenization in one word, I would say incentives, you know, getting people to do yes. things. And and it has it, it could almost have nothing to do with money. And, and then in the best token structures, um, people it won't have anything to do with money. Awesome. I love that. All right, Travis, you're next. Yeah, I, you know, um, I'll just be quick here is that, and I know this is a very lofty question, but how much, to, to get your ultimate dream and vision, how much worldwide, how long and how much money would it take all parties to get this thing flying? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. So how long so if we're talking true global healthcare system, if like you were, if you were queen of the world, how long and how much money would you take to put this together? <laughs> so I, I would want to, and I think it's totally possible. I would want to complete this in um, at least the, the global infrastructure, not just in the United States, probably five to seven years. And then I do think that it would take uh, a substantial investment. <laughs> Well, Probably. hey, let's, let's take it offline. I don't want to waste someone's time, but let's. I sent you a LinkedIn. Let's talk because I, I, we have a deal with the United Nations, and they were looking after a, one of their SDGs, social development goals in healthcare. And I'm trying to find a partner for that. So let's chat. Sweet. Okay, great. I think it's. I will say it's sooner than than it looks. 
Um, as long as people don't get stuck on the fact that we're creating, we're not creating, and we will never replace electronic medical records at the government or system level. This is truly patient-led, patient-owned, and I think we can get there uh, pretty quickly. Okay, and there's other sure. partnerships in Germany and so on that make sense too. But we'll 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 we'll, we'll hook up. Yep. Awesome. All right, Lou. Thanks. Um, so you know, one of the things when you know Alex came and he actually talked a little while ago at the at the collective, and you know, one of the things that he talked about was that the legacy systems here, you know, were you know moving at a glacial pace if they were moving at all. And so he had been spending uh, more of his time in Africa where he didn't have to deal with the legacy systems, you know, but was actually dealing with people who wanted, you know, what, uh, you know, what, what, what they're building. So I was wondering, you know, how much time you've spent outside the U.S. and, and where you think it'll take off first. I have. So my global health experience is mostly in South America, so in Spanish speaking countries. And we have a lot of partners and friends in Africa that are very excited about what we're doing, but I have actually been focused more on the United States intentionally because that's the system that I know really, really well. But Travis, if there's a UN global partner, that would be a different conversation. Well, I, you know, <laughs> you put a good lipstick on it and you fund a lot of money through those guys for good and, you know, and it's free money from a do donate. It makes a lot of sense, you know, so yeah. anyway, we'll chat. Yeah. yeah. So I... That is, so I have experience with the legacy systems and that's why we are not focusing on them. Actually, Tamarin launched by focusing on a Medicare program and it was an awful experience. Uh, the idea is right. I actually managed the program when I was at Yale, but talk about moving at a glacial pace. Holy <laughs> cow, it was awful. Um, so, and that's also why we're focused on the patient. The other reason we're focused on the patient is because the area that's moving fast in healthcare globally is direct to consumer, which sounds weird. But you don't have to go see a primary care physician at Mass Gen in the brick and mortar building down the street. You can see a PCP virtually. Um, you can see a musculoskeletal team member virtually. That's what my former boss at Yale New Haven is doing. So you actually don't have to follow the traditional system. And that's the area that's moving a lot faster. And to get it to move faster, we have to put the data in the hands of the patient. So sorry, legacy healthcare, but uh, <laughs> kind of in the dust. <laughs> One, one more comment. So you're treating this as like a self-sovereign situation for medical records and, and, exactly. and service. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And using blockchain as a way to tokenize it to make sure that, that all the blah, blah, blah. Okay. Got it. Got yep. It. Yep. Yep. And, and would, would, would uh, you think that you tap money from like Medicare and Medicaid SSA and all that, would they even talk to you about flowing money your way for compensation for this implementation? Not yet, but there is a blockchain proponent at the CDC. I know some people don't like the CDC, okay. but there's, there's a couple of grants in healthcare I'll talk to you about too as well. I sorry, I'm not want to dominate here. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, uh, JP. You're next. Hey, Kat. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Um, just a, a couple quick questions. The the thoughts that you have around not being EMR but being patient central. Um, I heard you mention Epic and legacy systems. How are you gonna essentially allow the consumer, the patient to plug into insurance and pass through. Um, you and I both know EMR are generally very important as we pass through fees. And so how does this maybe plug in as an API or something with legacy payment systems? Because that's really the trigger here. Yeah, we are open to that. So we're open to a push and pull system, which can be done. Um, we have a lot of folks in our network that are higher up in the health insurance space and are very interested in what we're doing. Um, and so that, that bypass is possible. Um, we're going to start by extracting data from systems. We ha have already started by extracting data from the systems that already exist and not push it back in. And the reason for that is um, physicians are really overwhelmed already and it, what's the kind of the missing point in healthcare, a missing piece in healthcare is the patient being an advocate for themselves and offloading time from the physicians. And so that's why we're really focusing on patient, patient advocacy first. We can even pull data from health insurance portals and bring it in so that you can see and compare across all physicians in network and out of network in our database, um, in, your, in your Shiro application and see how they rank on um, 
feedback and quality outcomes and cost. We're putting all of that together in one place. So we're really kind of, it's gonna be the hub. Um, so I'm not against pushing it back into legacy systems. Um, we've already had those conversations. I just don't think that that is, uh, that is not as near term as kind of extraction and, and patient profile in your hands, if that makes sense. So now it does. Uh, I guess the second piece to this is knowing that you're working in Latin America and in South America, maybe targeting Africa. Um, I think you heard from one of our colleagues on the call that UN has a lot of focuses on SDGs there. Um, do you have any type of plan to do any type of matching with local physician, local physician, sorry about that, um, in Africa or in some of these, uh, you know, third world nations so that some of the patients can directly connect? Again, to me, when I think about those sustainable development goals uh, that, that were mentioned, those are the simple programs that are going to allow some of this simple, you know, some of the metrics of what you're providing in data to really blow up. Because again, you know, UN, IMF, World Bank all project Africa as the largest technological, the largest economic, and the largest population growth in the next 20 years. So I think that's a smart target. Um, if there's, you know, we, we have a lot of folks here in the UN, but, uh, you know, I've been a founder of the UN Global Compact. And if there's things in that network you need, I work with the African Continental Congress quite a bit. Awesome. That sounds great. And I'm definitely open to that. Uh, one of our advisors is Dr. John Halamka, who has done a lot of, he's tapped globally for interoperability work in healthcare and has done a lot of work specifically in healthcare, funded by a, a variety of foundations. Um, one of the things that will be important is internet connectivity. And an area that I think is quite exciting are mesh networks and incentivized mesh networks that would be able to tie into what we're doing. So I have thought about it, just haven't pursued it because I haven't had the right partners um, and have really focused on the United States. But the yes, what we're doing would be a better way to leapfrog legacy, basically redo, do better than what we've done in the United States when it comes to patient data. Like don't, don't repeat the mistakes that we did here. No, I, I think, again, you know, when the UN deploys a lot of its skiffs into a lot of these troubled nations, um, this is where bringing in and capturing some of this data and being able to capture it and utilize it in a way that people haven't done before might be very effective. So um, let me look at some programs and uh, I'll send over some suggestions, but thank you for your time today. Yeah. Thanks, JP. Julie? Thanks, Kat, for your presentation today. Um, this is needed, and if we can pass savings on to members and consumers, it's great. Uh, one of my biggest clients is Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I have a team of people, and we go and we do all of their major presentations for them. I also do the events for the collective, so I feel like I'm boots on the ground when it comes to gathering information about um, members and people and what their needs are. My question to you is, this is the biggest challenge. With Blue Cross Blue Shield, they have a program called Blue 365. Getting members to do anything that can benefit them, even to get a big screen TV, tablets, laptops, televisions, chairs, cookware, anything, to get people to do anything um, is arduous at best. Um, at best, they would might even complain about a low a premium to go into a doctor. So, for it, it as this gets implemented, which is a great service. I think we should and figure out how to do it. When you when it comes to legacy systems, and not just legacy systems, members who are generally lazy, they want to eat a burger and lose weight. They want to not go to the gym and have a six pack abs. They want to not have heart disease, but they still want to eat their French fries. So knowing that even if you put this data into the members' hands, they are not going to know what to do with it. So my question is, do you have? some portion of your program that you know that's going to be a long-term educational program because I still talk to people who want to walk in and not pay a copay and they yeah. don't want to pony up their Fitbit so they can earn rewards or take their health assessment so they can actually earn rewards so they can gain things that are more monetary but they're you know they can't be given something monetary per se. So most consumers don't know about owning their own data anyway. Most mm -hmm. people don't want to know how their car runs. They don't want to know about the back end of their healthcare system. So I think the big component to this is not only education for us, because you're preaching to the choir for us, is education for the members and people, what that means. Do you have a, a component to that for um, the general public? 
Yeah, so we, um, I talked a lot about data dividends here because that's something we're familiar with and owning data because that's something that we care about in the Web3 community. But you're right, most people don't care. Most people and uh, most people are happy to give away their data for something easy in return. Um, and laziness is, is a huge factor. Um, the reason why, one of the reasons why this hasn't worked in the past is because it was too hard for the individual to, to get this done. Um, it required, you couldn't just connect in and get the data really easily. Um, we have seen a, uh, so once we did move to earn, so we kind of went to market with move to earn, we saw a lot of excitement around that. We have seen other companies be really successful in the move to earn space. We also have seen a lot of success around cash back and savings in other industries, not yet in healthcare models that would work really well in healthcare. Um, and then we also know that, so we've kind of sub, sub uh, group populations based on income, if you will, kind of what drives them, what they're looking for. And then there is typically the higher income folks that are much more interested in optimization. So health optimization. You can actually work with all of those with the product in the end goal. Um, I will say, unfortunately, that I think there are just going to be people that are not interested. Um, they are not in. They are not interested in the incentives. They are not interested. Um, you know, like you said, a, a big screen TV isn't enough for them to um, to make a move in general. Um, what I will say is that the vast majority of Americans, specifically, are frustrated with the cost of healthcare. Um, and finding ways to decrease the cost of healthcare could be a way to bring in more of those folks. So eliminating that copay, decreasing that copay. So incentives could tie into eliminating the copay in general. Um, I have also done some research and I've been blown away by the amount of people that get obsessed and excited about $1 at Amazon. By completing 150 minutes of movement in a week and they get $1, they get really excited. So it's, it's not gonna be for everybody. I just don't think it can. The only way that we get digital data on everybody is by the way that EMRs have done it, which was, I hate to use this word, but coerced by the federal government. It was required um, and they had no role in it. It was done by their physicians and they didn't have a role or a say. And that's, that's how their information got in there. I think, so I don't, I, I don't think we're gonna be able to get everybody. I don't think any app has ever been able to get anybody, even Amazon. So I know that's probably not the answer you wanna hear, but we have thought a lot about how we kind of target at different levels of the population. Thanks. Thanks, Kat. Um, unfortunately, I'm gonna to have to cut the questions off right here. Uh, big day for the collective today, and I'm gonna make give Lou a chance to make some announcements. <laughs> um, and I'm also gonna talk, but thank you so much for the questions and for Kat for being here. Um, we're definitely gonna need to have a follow-up call to see how the collective can help such an amazing company. Awesome, thank you so much. It was great to see everybody. I'm going to turn my video off and just answer some questions in the chat. So Good. perfect. perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Yep. Hey, Kat, will you also drop your information in the chat in case anybody needed to get through to you? Yes, definitely, yep. As well as a copy of the deck, if, if yes. you can. It's not that pretty, but I certainly will. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I'm going to share my screen for a moment. Let's go there. Do, do. So what do we got going on? So <laughs> these calls are going to start being a little more direct in terms of uh, the ask for, for help. Uh, from the collective members, you know, we're, we're excited. We're about the, the great value we're bringing. Um, want to bring up four things uh, quickly. Uh, the first is today we have a, a webinar. So this is the first webinar that we're doing, you know, the AngelList as the Crypto Oracle Collective, AngelList Syndicate with more than a thousand LPs. And we just pushed Trust Exchange Live on AngelList yesterday. And we're having a, a, um, a, a webinar today uh, for uh, AngelList LPs to come and you know learn about trust exchange you know we do this every time that we bring something to angelus and very few of the members come uh, lps come live but lots watch later on but it would be great to have a, a good showing from collective members there so if you have the time and an interest uh, come to the uh uh come to the webinar it's following this at two o'clock sharp so you know i'll drop off here and start up that webinar you know and ed sullivan the ceo of that company is a rock star uh, Max, can you just? Oh, Lou, did you freeze for me or everybody? 
Yep, I think he's he got frozen. Everyone, look at rug. See, I'm not the only one that gets rug. Elon. Yeah, so I can. Okay. I can give the website update. I will be uh, emailing a couple of the co collective members that have reached out uh, to Lilia that uh, showed interest in helping redesign the website. So you'll probably get an email today or tomorrow morning. So I'll cover for Lou on that one. And then, and then to arrange a call with some collective members about the re redesigning of that. Okay, thanks, thanks Tyler. Tyler. Am, I, am I unfrozen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's see if I can turn this on. You got to tell your sister to Max to get better uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, also follow us on Twitter. With supposedly we've got 147 collective members. We only have 119 Twitter followers. Come on. The least you can do is follow us on Twitter. And Max is going to put that that in the uh, in the chat as well. Uh, follow us on YouTube. Uh, so uh, we're just at 26 YouTube subscribers. We started that one just a little while ago. And then, um, you know, the telegram's a nice way that we're communicating amongst ourselves uh, in between collective calls. So, you know, we've got 61 members who are there. And so people want more of the collective, you can get it uh, at telegram. Great. And so Max, did you, did you drop those all in? Uh, I got Twitter, I'm doing the others. Okay, let's see, I'm on... Uh, Looking at our Crypto Oracle Collective YouTube to 27. Should be, should be 50 at least by the time we leave this call. <laughs> um, so that is what's up there. And then tokenization. Um, so Max, I'll, I'm fine if you're done. If you haven't, have you put the YouTube in yet? Yeah, YouTube's in. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna start watching our subscribers grow while you talk about the, the tokenization update. All right. Um, before I start talking about tokenization, we probably should stop recording. <laughs> oh. So I don't get in trouble with the SEC later on. That's what I thought too. Yeah, you offer security <laughs> for sale on it. Yeah.